Hey, what the frick is up, Goth Gamer Nation? It's your number one gamer ghoul here with a a game that just freaking came out months ago. Hey, that's that's a big deal for me. Did you know they keep like making these things? I'd always assumed it was somewhere in like 2008. <laughs> they were just like, that's it, we're done with games. But no, dude. I, I don't know. Here's one of them. Mondan is a first-person horror adventure alpine goat petting simulator developed by Swiss studio Hidden Fields and published by MWM Interactive for PC, PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, and Xbox Series S. One of those has to be fake in 2021. Some of the earliest articles about it seem to imply it was meant to come to the Nintendo Switch first, but I can find no evidence of that, and I need you to know that there are limits to how far I will go to investigate games. That limit is apparently turning on a console. Mondan began life in 2014 as a solo project from then software developer and first time game developer Michel Ziegler, who conceived of the project as a comic book until he found that it would be more fitting as a game. This led to a trial run or proof of concept in a short game called The Colony, which was similarly built from Ziegler's illustrations, but in this case meant to replicate the results of a risograph. Mondan, however, would be an entirely hand-penciled game with a horror narrative drawing from the history and myths of the Swiss Alps. A build was shown at the 2018 GDC, where it received an honorable mention for best in play, as well as the attention of its eventual publisher. It was released to pretty much unanimous praise from those who played it, but it could have benefited from having a few more eyes on it. Not many reviews, but most are positive. It currently sits at a very positive on Steam, and a Nice. On Metacritic. I'll admit it's got a unique look that certainly made it stand out to me, and it's always nice proving that I'm capable of playing new games. It's easy to get locked into the comfort of nostalgia, but you should recognize that as a siren song. One day you're dusting off and you set aside some time to fire up your copy of and next thing you know, you're letting it control you, define you. You get stuck there, unable to accept change, unable to accept the passage of time, and before you know it, you're talking about games on YouTube. Given that a large theme of the project is the inherent eeriness of rural life and the sort of ancient darkness that such a picturesque countryside setting could be hiding, inspiration was drawn from early folk horror films like Witchfinder General, The Blood on Satan's Claw, and The Wicker Man. These three films are often referred to as the unholy trinity and the progenitors of the genre that is continued by films like The Witch and Midsommar. Mondan follows the format of guy goes to country and has a bad time because it sucks here and there's like Colts maybe and no Wi-Fi. We open on a man named Cordin. I should have prefaced that I'm uh, not going to pronounce anybody's name correctly uh, or any of the words for anything. Uh, and I didn't know this language existed until about a week ago. <clears throat> but Cordin is returning to his hometown, that is the game's namesake, by bus. He reads a letter sent to him by the town's priest, Father Jeremias, explaining that Cordin's grandfather, Florin, died when his barn caught fire and the body was already buried, so there's no reason to visit but he just wanted him to know. Get Getting a, a strange vibe from this letter that essentially says, you all gotta come up here. We, uh, we already did like the whole funeral and shit. He's super dead and definitely buried. So we're cool up here. Yeah, thanks. Everything's cool. We're cool. Uh, are you, are you hey, cool? Jerry, we got any like bigger trash bags and stuff? <laughs> Oh, you're writing a letter. I'll come back. Cordin decides to pay the town a visit and better understand his grandfather's fate. Upon inspection of the burned down barn, he has a vision of a man painting the barn as it burns, and his grandfather calls for help. In attempting to save him, he is grabbed by an old man in a suit and a feathered hat. He grabs his hand and imparts on him a sort of curse that makes his hand, uh, firstly look all kinds of fucked up, but it also seems to cause Cordin to bend space and time in certain moments, allowing him to to discover his grandfather's burned body and you know it's it's really kind of sad yeah but at the very least it seems like he died doing what he loved ripping fat fucking clouds bro with his spot in the graveyard left vacant. So we just got here and already there's a lot of mystery afoot. Like, uh, how do I discern what is meant to be a photograph and what is a painting in this world? Who is this old man? What happened to my hand? What actually happened to our grandfather? And why did the priest try to cover it up? A cover up involving a priest. 
What is this world coming to? I managed to finish this game in almost exactly six hours, and I felt as though I was taking my time, but suffice to say, it's not a very long game, but it does have a narrative and atmosphere worth experiencing on your own if you're interested and seeing as though it's a very new game at the time of my writing this. I carry with me a slightly heightened measure of guilt in spoiling its story. I'll get over it, though, and you can skip to this time if you would like to not have all the story spoiled, but do me a favor. If you do wind up playing it, come back and watch this bit later. I don't know exactly how YouTube works anymore, but I think watching all of the video might be helpful. Either that or they want me to put the whole video in vertical and broken into 15 second clips. You know, whatever diminishes creativity and effort. Jeremias is obviously surprised to see Kordin. Oh, hey dude. I thought like in the letter I said not to. It's cool. How you been? When confronted, he admits that not only was he unable to retrieve your grandfather's body, he refused to because the barn is cursed. He kind of shuffles you off saying you can stay at his old house for the night, but should probably leave on the first bus tomorrow. That night, Corden's lucky hand, I guess, uh, starts getting extra fucky and strange straw men start to appear and begin wreaking havoc around town. But you know what the real problem is? It's the systemic corruption in Mundan's clergy. Okay, that's my argument. It's a <laughs> straw man. There's something there. Uh, we hole up in Furin's old house and in the morning meet a little girl who hands us a drawing that triggers a flashback depicting Furin many many years ago. He and a couple army buddies impotently watch an approaching army that they would stand no chance of stopping. Their commanding officer, realizing the hopelessness of the situation, chooses to drink himself into a coma while his men watch their death slowly approach. That is until the old man appears, offering help. A switch this Christian novella called The Black Spider has been cited as a great source of inspiration for the spiritual allegory of the story. There are tons of parallels to this story as well as other similar Swiss fables, particularly the legend of the Teiflsbrücke or Devil's Bridge. Uh, the story goes some Swiss herdsmen were having a lot of difficulty dealing with the turbulent river running through this gorge and couldn't get a bridge built so they could transport goods via mule. That is until the devil showed up and offered to build it in exchange for the first soul to cross it. They agree, and when it came time to fulfill their end of the deal, they sent a goat across the bridge first, which I guess there wasn't a clause for in the contract, and the devil just had to accept that, even though I think uh, we all knew what he meant when he said soul. In anger, the devil attempted to destroy the bridge with a massive rock, but was scared off by an old woman wielding a crucifix. Uh, not that it would have been difficult to surpass, but I do prefer the conclusion Mondan goes with over this rather anticlimactic ending. Also, like, not to side with the devil here, but you agreed to a certain form of payment for labor, you couldn't otherwise do so. It, it is kind of shitty that you reneged on this. You couldn't spare a baby or something? You had to waste a goat? Goats are cool. They're useful. They got wacky eyes. You can scream at them and they'll fall over. What's a baby going to do if you scream at it? Go up to a random baby and scream at it. The results are disappointing. Goats and goat imagery is all over this game. Some of them you can even pet. Uh, sometimes the game doesn't like when you do this too much though. You even find the decapitated head of a goat named Alegria, which you can carry around in your backpack and talk to whenever she sounds like she's got something on her mind. I never thought I'd form such a strong affection for a disembodied goat that speaks in romance, but just listen to her little, her little, her little sleepy noises. <laughs> I could- I would kill. I would murder. I would do time for this goat. After this vision, it's clear that something has not only destroyed the chapel, but twisted it into a dark parody of itself. Also, rocks have begun to rain from the sky. Kurin asks Jeremias about his vision, which is apparently something Florina, the little girl, is just capable of doing, as she was always peculiar. I'm curious if that choice of word was the result of an odd translation, or they just meant for that to be surreal and vague. Or maybe it ties in with some other bit of mythology. I can't discern. The priest tells you to take Alegria's head to a man named Corporal Walther, a reclusive soldier from his grandfather's group that has since lived in an elaborate bunker with Florina, his niece. Florina is incredibly creepy uh, for being seemingly helpful to you throughout the game. She doesn't talk at all and just sort of vacantly follows you around or shows up places.
What's up, little bud? You got a staring problem, pal? Staring at you blankly while you trip out on visions of the old man and then disappearing suddenly. This is, to some degree, how all children behave in my eyes, so really, they've just captured this uh, rather realistically. On the way to Walther, Curin rests at the home of a painter named Giovanni Serpentini, whose paintings appear to magically affect their real-life subjects. Remembering the canvas found in front of his grandfather's barn, he asks if he was responsible, but Giovanni has simply painted too many paintings to remember if he was responsible for that or not. He implies that he too was given a gift from the old man, and he is also the grandson of someone from that fateful night with the soldiers. After meeting with Walther and reuniting him with Alegria, Curin has another flashback depicting the events that followed right after the last one. His grandfather agrees to trade with the old man, one unbaptized soul, to guarantee the swift defeat of the approaching enemy. Seeing no other way of protecting the town, he signs and the old man causes an avalanche that buries all of the enemy soldiers. The next morning, Walther elaborates that the old man was tricked before they could uphold their end, given Alegria in place of a human soul, and now the old man should be imprisoned in the black mountain that looms over Mundan. <laughs> Oh, oh wait, you're talking about something else. Since he was able to Trojan horse his way into town thanks to you, we can assume that whatever they used to seal him away didn't hold. So Curin heads for his mountain home in hopes of putting Alegria to rest and breaking the curse on his grandfather. Unlike some of the stories that inspired this one, there doesn't seem to be a simple solution to what's happening. You can't just wave a cross at him and you'll scamper off for the rest of time. It's much more conceptual and strange. Most of what happens in this mountain like, I, I don't, I don't fucking know what's going on, but I sort of wish there was more of this in the game. Because I do appreciate that despite functioning as a religious allegory, it mostly avoids direct references to Christianity. The old man does prefer his souls to be unbaptized, and initially at least he doesn't seem to like crosses. But I don't get the impression that this guy adheres to the same rules as the Satan you and I know. Mark Pellegrino, of course. So the further it distinguishes itself from that and focuses on the psychological aspect of its horror, the more interesting it seems to me. And you do eventually try to combat him with a cross, uh, but he just kind of tosses it aside like every friendship I've ever had. The takeaway from this whole sequence is that at one point, the old man was imprisoned there, but was set free by Serpentini, who was given powers in exchange for his servitude. And the old man, finding little satisfaction in your grandfather's old, extremely bad baptized, communion wafer taste and ass soul, he kidnaps Florina as a replacement. He doesn't look like he has much to do. After all, he spends all his time in a mountaintop town with a population of 10, half of which are goats. So I'm guessing the whole time he's just been steaming about that deal falling through until Curin shows up and offers a new opportunity for revenge. Which is especially petty because the whole premise of that original deal was founded on a lie anyway. There never was any invading army, it was an illusion he created to pressure Furin into signing. Seems very complicated when ultimately he is not opposed to kidnapping a child without involving paperwork. At this point you're presented with a number of choices that determine which ending you'll receive. It is endlessly amusing to me that the fate of the main cast is a variable determined by your playstyle, but the story arc of the GOAT character is a constant with one outcome, and it makes it seem rightfully as though this game is really about her. This has all been about atonement for our ancestors' mistreatment of a beautiful, rectangle-eyed f And while some are better than others, none of these endings really feel like the true good canon ending with every possible loose end tied up, which I find to be appropriate. There's no reason why you'd be certain that your grandfather's soul was saved, or that Florino wasn't possessed, or that the old man was truly defeated. After all, you're just some guy that unintentionally became mixed up in some ancient cosmic beef that's way out of your pay grade. Maybe you scored one for humanity today, but this guy's been around for a while and will likely continue to be as long as people, I don't know, keep trying to build bridges across inconvenient terrain. Not today, Satan, but TTYL. There's a lot of finer details to this story that, like, I wouldn't know how to describe what I'm seeing with my eyes, but it looks cool, and I'm sure a more perceptive gamer and someone more well-versed in Swiss history and culture could piece together a clearer narrative. I do like how it really felt like I was an outsider, that I just walked into an old, eerie world that I didn't fully understand. That's ultimately what I find to be the strongest part of Mondan's story. If you look at it on paper, it's like a slightly more fleshed-out retelling of a folktale, but the atmosphere 
sheer and detail of its world fills in so much, giving it so much weight and texture. It muddies the binary nature of such stories, leaving the morality or alignment of everyone in question. There's a lot said by just showing you, by letting you figure out how to play it, and learn what everything is without holding your hand too much. It indulges in creepy, surreal visuals that just sort of happen without much explanation, and I was just along for the ride. But they never felt like pointless non-sequiturs, just strange parts of a strange world that I was a stranger in. There is a dreamy logic to the way everything functions, the way people talk, alienating you from the narrative further. Everyone has some kind of secret, some ancient guilt burdening them, and even the masked figures carrying out labor in the mountains toil away to some deeply unsettling, unknowable end. The way they're dressed says, I'm going to work collecting honey, but the way they float a couple inches off the ground and pursue you with a basket full of aggressive bees says, where are you going, city boy? Ah, not the bees. Ah. Nicolas Cage, 2006. There is an inherent beauty and uncanniness, I think, to these older lifestyles full of archaic technology and barbaric seeming religious practices. This game just tosses these ideas at you and carries on as if it's not strange that you sleep with a plank of wood covered in spikes on top of you for protection, presumably from something smart enough to enter your home, but not smart enough to lift a piece of wood off of you. In this case, I do think it elevates these otherwise mundane processes and aspects of rural life to be newly unsettling and full of its own idiosyncratic brand of magic. So while Mundan can competently tell a story, it's one that is treated with a blunt matter-of-factness while everything else is drenched in mystery. Just looking at a painting on a wall or your reflection in a mirror can suck you into some bizarre sequence revealing the nostalgia or terror pervading Kurdin's mind. A similar thing happens to me whenever I... There is a confident nature to Mundan's storytelling, but its gameplay seems to have one thing it really wants to do while offering distractions with other concepts it half commits to. I think at its heart the game is meant to, in every sense, be a slow burn. It's something you're supposed to take your time exploring. Exploration and light puzzles are the baseline that it accomplishes rather well. It's not by any means a large area to explore compared to other games, but there are still a lot of details, encounters, and items you could pass by if you don't stop to poke around. Plenty of wide open spaces, and I thought it a cute contrivance that you had to climb to the tallest point in an area to sketch out a map. Like climbing towers in an Ubisoft game, except it creates a very pretty, if slightly vague map instead of a screenshot of Google Maps covered in a sickening confetti of side objectives. Combat is certainly interesting. I wouldn't say it's enjoyable in the truest sense, more like I get the impression it was meant to be stressful and meant to be avoided if possible. You can usually find a way to sneak past enemies, or a way of dispatching them with without engaging them face to face, like setting fire to hay bales while a straw man is standing next to it. Otherwise, you have a destructible pitchfork you can use, or an old service rifle. In the beginning, you'll find it very hard to just rush an enemy and start poking it. This is alleviated the more you upgrade Kurin's three attributes, the first being his bravery, which you accomplish by brewing coffee, which is kind of an involved process but has a pleasant meditative quality to it. I could have done with more essentially mundane but enjoyable tasks that result in a stat boost. If you neglect to do this, Kurin will freeze up during fights, refusing to swing his weapon and refusing to run. Eating food raises his max health, and reading training manuals steadies his aim with the rifle, which is pretty squirrely at first. At no point does he feel like a capable soldier. It's still easy to die if you're not careful. After all, Kurin is very much... Uh, just some fucking guy. Ammo is pretty scarce, so it's important to make shots count, but for the most part combat can almost always be avoided. Uh, but yeah, come on, I'm a gamer. You let me shoot a man, I'm gonna shoot a man. I feel like in a way, it's because of this that combat never seemed to settle into a loop. It never felt wholly necessary, and I could never decide if that was a strength or a failing. If it added tension or removed it, that it was always a possibility. I personally enjoy horror games that allow you to defend yourself in a limited capacity and initially I was pleased with what they were doing, but I eventually began to feel like there wasn't enough time or attention devoted to it. I don't feel like there was anything in the gameplay or story that was missing per se, but I selfishly do want more game time. More time to run over straw guys with a truck and pet goats. I suppose it's a dangerous line of thinking to want more uh, hats on hats with a game, but, but, but 
Goat. All the mechanics for combat and stealth are there, it just doesn't seem like the game is all that interested in pushing you to use, well either of them but one more so. A couple reviews I read seem to think the game lacks a degree of instruction or intuitiveness, which I actually found it struck a good balance with. I never felt hopelessly stuck, and aside from one particular puzzle, I never felt like something was overly vague. I usually figured it out by exploring more or checking my journal, and because the game is slow and atmospheric I didn't feel like it interrupted pacing or slowed down my momentum, I was taking my time anyway. It assumes you have basic knowledge of how most games work and isn't gonna tutorialize every little function. Nothing told me that coffee raises my fear resistance other than playing the game. I saw a poster for coffee, Kurdin commented that it provides bravery. I drank the coffee and I, I saw a bar go up that was a scared face to a happy face. I get this. I went to therapy as a child. I know how to read a scale of frowny face to smiley face. What they weren't able to intimate uh, as a child in real life is that it's less of a scale and more of a light switch being rapidly flipped in either direction. <sighs> yes, hello? I, I did it again goes without saying that in the indie horror scene, Mondan certainly sticks out. Its unique, hand-drawn art style is probably going to be the selling point and what it is remembered by, and that would be fair because it's a bet that really pays off. There really isn't much that looks like this game and shares its haunting, impressionistic aesthetic. It's the roughness of it that really distinguishes it. The room for random and error, yet it's all cohesive and alive. I'd often find myself just staring into characters' faces for whole minutes because it really looks like somebody's sketchbook came to life and entered the third dimension. It's fucking wild. And knowing how much work and heart went into it only has me fawning over it more. And it's got a couple little problems. There are little visual glitches that pop up and it doesn't have the best draw distance. Draw distance. Draw distance. <clears throat> draw distance. I love the lack of UI. It's just so clean and nothing is distracting me from the world. The only thing that pops up unprompted is when you receive or complete an objective, which even that I could do without. I can just check my journal, which itself is beautifully designed. I never minded having to skim through it to find a map or note Kurdin made because it's just so pleasant to look at. He really did have fun with it, especially this commemorative sketch of his grandfather. All burnt up, not burnt up. All burnt up, not burnt up. Alive and happy, cursed and dead. Same with the inventory. In fact, I think of all the design splendors, the inventory is my favorite. Not only is it essentially a great inventory, which you know is my jam, it's got all these adorable item models perfectly slotted in, and when you mouse over them, they make a little sound associated with them. Oh, it's just gorgeous. Ooh, I'm pissing. The sound design is great and a perfect accompaniment to its visuals. It doesn't feel overdone with whimsical game sounds. It's all kind of realistic and tactile down to the slight jangling of your backpack while walking. The music is composed of different shades of ambience that don't steal your attention, but instead weave themselves in the blanket of diegetic sound and even the variety of vintage music that plays on radios. While this can often lull you into a warm, nostalgic state, uh, this made me vulnerable to several moments of anxiety and even some pretty effective jump scares. The flurry of strings that grows louder and louder when you're spotted by one of the beekeepers stands out as particularly unsettling, especially when it just starts happening and you don't know where he is, so you're just frantically looking around with the grim knowledge that the bee man coming. Ah, uh, occupado. I forgot to mention, but sometimes uh, Kurin's lucky hand will start freaking out when enemies are nearby so this combined with the music cue seemed a bit like overkill and i think i would have preferred just having the music obviously i don't speak the language and didn't know the language was a language so i can't speak to how great the voice acting is but it sounds like everybody's doing a good enough job i like how frail and soft the priest's voice is but yeah, and them's cheers, the letters all us. and also when you like push by them's cheers. And even the talk radio channel has some kind of comforting quality to it. It's a very pretty language, and I especially like the way it sounds coming out of goats. <laughs> Bruh. 
Another game from these lazy developers. Bad graphics, so outdated, basic gameplay, and horror stupid game really. Do you mean these lazy developers in like a general sense? Because this is this guy's first full game and seeing as though it took like 7 years to complete and was mostly accomplished by one person, that seems about as far from lazy as you could get. It also feels odd reading outdated graphics. Because I mean, I think it looks gorgeous, but also like it's made of pencil sketches which are intentionally rough and look like a human drew them because literally a human drew every little piece of this game. I guess pencil sketches as a medium are outdated in some sense, but also you seem overly critical and like a generally unpleasant person to hang out with. Ruthlessly boring. A review somewhere described this as Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth, if it was entirely like its opening. Games are nothing alike, and this is a very generic walking sim with combat tacked on. You know, there aren't very many reviews of this game up, let alone bad ones, but I imagine, given time, this would make up a majority of them. It's interesting, arriving at the sort of ground floor uh, of this kind of take. At this point, I'm immune to it. I I'm over the use of walking sim as a video game slur. If you're the type of person to blanket any game that is slow paced, focused on exploration, and is not a constant shooting gallery, then I'd wager this is what you would consider a walking sim. I wouldn't call it that because there is death, combat, puzzles, dialogue options, you know, interactivity other than walking. I do kind of see where one could make the comparison with Dark Corners of the Earth. There is on and off stealth and combat, lots of dread and mystery abound, and environmental puzzles, although it's probably far more likely that, uh, you could complete this game without patches or downloading save files, which gives it a considerable edge in my book. Mondan is not a very good game. It's not bad, but it's just very plain. The visuals are okay. The hand-drawn part of it is in name only. Only the textures are hand-drawn. Everything else is a typical low-poly model, and it rarely sells the feeling of the game being hand-drawn. A hand-drawn shader would have gone a long way in selling the looks. Maybe the dev tried it, and it didn't work, but looking at mountains with stretched pencil textures is just just not right. Audio is fine. Wow, what a worthless reduction of an insanely inventive and original looking game. It's a 3D game. There are 3D models in this, yes, and they are drawn over by hand, hence hand drawn. Uh, you're making a bizarre assumption that the intention of the developer was to make something indistinguishable from a two-dimensional drawing, uh, which games like that do exist. You could play uh, like Never Ending Nightmares or something. Maybe you'll finish that one or get two hours in and write a bad review because it didn't semantically stick to the art style. You could have confirmed it had or didn't have in a fucking trailer. And the audio is great. Tedious to play. Backtracking a fair bit, sometimes objectives are just a pain to find. At one point, I had to spend 10 minutes tracking back the way I came to try to find one of the three multiple quest objectives without much in the way of an indicator. Tedious, plotting, and slow, not really that scary either if that's what you're looking for. There's a creepy moment here and there, but honestly wasn't worth my time. Yeah, well, that's fair. I don't, uh, I don't find anything especially bothersome about this review, which angers me. Wow. Look at this. Look at this beautiful fucking nightmare. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. Not a taco shop in sight! I really enjoyed Mundan, but then again, I'm drawn to games with a lot of personality and heart in them, which almost always trumps overly slick design or an exciting gameplay loop. It did most of the stuff I want out of a game. I got to rifle through people's belongings, spy on them, pet their goats, but it also showed me a culture and world I haven't experienced in a video game. Its story unfolds like a charming fairy tale that isn't going out of its way to put a flourish on any of it. It's not full of twists and turns, it feels ancient and like something that probably repeated itself in many iterations at other points in history. A tale as old as time, as true as it can be, barely even friends, then somebody bends. Are those the lyrics? That doesn't sound right. It's a pretty short game, and I found myself wishing I could spend more time in it, uh, but I enjoyed all of that time. Exploration was satisfying, combat played its part, uh, didn't feel bad, but it didn't feel vital. I liked that some enemies just had a specific way you avoid their attacks, like blowing smoke at swarms of bees. But you know what? I'm never gonna say no to shooting someone. Please don't take that out of context. Oh boy, does this game have a look. I can't get enough of it. And the way it all ties together with your journal and inventory is just oof. Mamma mia, motherfucker. The thing's a good inventory. 
does to me. Based on what Ziegler and Hidden Fields has done so far, I wouldn't expect a return to this exact style and format and whatever they tackle next, but I wouldn't be opposed to it, to just this, but bigger and more streamlined. But also, if not, that's fine, because right out the gate, they already show a lot of promise. I would recommend this game if you don't need a complex story or a consistent queue of dudes to shoot, though I would not consider it a walking sim if you don't like games that are typically put in that classification, you might struggle with this one all the same. You certainly get to do a fair bit of walking and driving. Remember, please don't add milk. And riding on a sled with a goatless head that's directing you with a magic bell. Come on. At the very least, I'm sure you'd have trouble finding another game that offered you that. Get out of your comfort zone. Pet a goat. If you don't pet this goat... Hey. Murder! That's the end of the video. Thank you for watching it. Uh, if you're feeling up for it, please engage with the video uh, so that I may be validated in the eyes of not only you, but YouTube. Uh, for if you do not smash that like, I may as well not exist. But anyway, also check the description for things like my Patreon, my Twitter, my Discord, uh, and merch and music. Mmm, and that's all. Okay. Thank you for watching. Thank you for all your support. Um, I'll do some patron names in the next video since this one, uh, went, went by a little quicker than normal. Uh, but I hope you're doing well. Uh, yeah, so stay goth, stay gaming.